Well, good evening. Good evening and welcome to Lakeview. We're honored that you've joined us tonight. It's a great crowd on a, on a Sunday night, so we're honored that you've joined us. I, I want to draw your attention to uh, the card that's in the pew in front of you or around you somewhere. It's a welcome card, and we love for all of our, our guests uh, to fill that out. And we love our members to fill that out as well, just so we have can kind of keep up with you and make sure you're doing well. And on the back is a place to um, put uh, prayer requests. If there's anything we can be praying uh, with you about, uh, I'd love we'd love for you to fill that out on the back. And you can place it in the offering plate as it comes by a little later. Normally, uh, during this time, we kind of start and we shake hands. But... I want to take a moment and teach you a new song, and uh, it's always hard uh, teaching new songs because I, I don't want to take time in the service to do that, but if you don't know the song, it's kind of hard for you to sing it too, right? So, so we're gonna, uh, we're gonna, I'm going to teach you the chorus and the bridge, and then we're going to stand and sing it, and then we'll shake hands, all right? Because I couldn't figure out any other way to do it because y'all get to talking during the welcome. And I can never get you back. All right? So I'm going to do it now. I know you don't believe that, but I just, just, I hear your conversations too, by the way, in my ear. I'm kidding. Uh, but I do hear every time you open a peppermint. Um, <laughs> but this song is called As For Me and My House. And I love, I love that passage in scripture. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Choose you this day whom you will serve. And there's not a lot of songs about that. And so this is kind of a newer song about that. And so let's teach, uh, give me a B flat there. Let's do. So the chorus goes like this. As for me and my house, we will serve, serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord our God. All right, you got that. Let's do it again. As for me and my house, we will serve, serve the Lord. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord our God. Very good. Then the bridge goes like this. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now in us. Let it heart and every tongue praise the one true God. Do you sing that again? Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now in us. Let every heart and every tongue praise the one true God. That's great. Let's stand and sing it. All right, let's do it. All right. Choose you this day whom you will serve The kingdom of heaven for the powers of earth Has he not spoken, have you not heard There is but one true God The God of our Father set us free His Son paid the price for our covenant peace through generations His mercy speaks We trust in one true God As for me and my house We will serve, serve the Lord As for me and my house We will serve the Lord our God That's great, that's good This house is the Lord is the Lord's and all within. May it be pleasing and holy to Him. Join by His Spirit, His people sing. Great is the one true God. Oh, great is the living God. As for me and my house, we will serve, serve the Lord. As for me, the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now in us. Let every heart and every tongue praise the one true God. Sing that again. Oh, praise the Father, praise the Son, praise the Spirit now in us. Let every heart and every tongue praise the one true God. 
13. Praise the Lord. Praise, O servants of the Lord. Praise the name of the Lord. Blessed be the name of the Lord from this time forth and forevermore. From the rising of the sun to its setting, the name of the Lord is to be praised. The Lord is high above all nations and his glory above the heavens. Who is like the Lord our God? who is seated on high, who looks far down on the heavens and the earth. He raises the poor from the dust and lifts the needy from the ash heap to make them sit with princes, with the princes of his people. He gives the barren woman a home, making her the joyous mother of children. Praise the Lord. Amen. Let's pray. Father, again, we come summoned by your word, commanded to praise you. 
Father, we also recognize you create in us what you command. So we come preceded by the God-man Jesus Christ, encouraged by the promise that you inhabit the praises of your people. Lord, we thank you this evening for the promises of this particular psalm, that you look far down on the heavens and the earth, and you raise the poor from the dust, you lift the needy from the ash heap. It's a remarkable way that you answered that. That promise came through one who came, making himself of no reputation, taking the form of a servant. And being found as a servant, he obeyed you even to the point of death, even the death of the cross, and you raised him from the ash heap. And now our hope is found in one who's been raised from the grave. We thank you, Lord. We've been united to him by grace through faith. And that's why we praise you tonight. Lord, one of the ways we also praise you is in our sacrificial giving. Because the order is this. Grace comes down, gratitude goes up, generosity flows out. We thank you, Lord, for the great privilege of giving back just a portion in reflection of our gratitude for what you have done for us in Jesus. We ask these things now in Jesus' name. Amen.
let's stand together as we sing. Only a holy God. Who else demands all the hosts of heaven? Who else can make every king bow down? Who else can whisper and darkness trembles only a holy God what other beauty demands such praises what other splendor outshines the sun what other majesty rules with justice Good evening. As we continue to behold our God, if you would turn your Bible to Genesis 32, we'll be looking at verses 30, 22 to 32, completing the chapter tonight. Thank you for Adam, praise team, Regen, for leading us in worship, one of the means by which we'll behold our God in the face of Christ. As we saw this morning, singing is a vital means of grace. So for our context tonight, if you would look with me, in verse 17 of Genesis 32, just to remind us what is going on here, he instructed his, one of his servants, uh, he's, he wants to see his brother, he wants to make reconciliation with his brother, and yet he's not fully trusting in the promises of God, so there's still manipulation going on. And Jacob, Jacob instructed the first, when Esau, my brother, meets you and asks you, to whom do you belong, where are you going? And whose are these ahead of you? Then you shall say they belong to your servant Jacob. They are present sent to my Lord Esau. And moreover, he is behind us. He likewise instructed the second and the third and all who followed the droves. You shall say the same things to Esau when you find him. You shall say, moreover, your servant Jacob is behind us. For he thought, I may appease him with the present that goes ahead of me. So that kind of gives you his motive there. 
Jacob's faith is like ours. It's an already but not yet. It's Lord, I believe, but help my unbelief. And afterward, I shall see his face. Perhaps he will accept me. So the present passed on ahead of him, and he himself stayed that night in the camp. Let's pray. Father, we have been um, singing about your mercy, your grace, that we know supremely in the face of your Son. And we desire to behold you through the preaching of your word tonight. Uh, we pray that, Lord, that you would give us eyes to behold, enlighten our eyes, light up our eyes tonight. We pray you would rejoice our hearts. And, Lord, that you would revive our souls in the gospel of Jesus Christ. And we ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. David Brainerd was an 18th century missionary to the American Indians. Um, he is best known, or uh, he came to be best known because of particular writings about him, perhaps most particular, the biography written about him, uh, the pen of Jonathan Edwards in 1749, that uh, deeply impacted men like Adoniram Judson, Henry Martin, and John Wesley, and William Carey. But when David Brainerd was a junior at Yale, and this was when Yale believed something, it was a Christian university that had been really founded because Harvard had become a, a kind of Unitarian school. But when he was a junior at Yale, someone asked him what he thought about a particular tutor there. And he sinfully responded, he has no more grace than this chair. Well, that got back to the president, and the president summoned Brainerd, and the president of Yale told him that he must confess before the student body. And Brainerd said, no, uh, my, my words were private comments, and I do not see the need to make a public confession. And so the president of Yale expelled Brainerd from Yale. Now, the, the problem there was that in those days in, in that particular place in Connecticut, no minister could be installed in a church unless he was a graduate of either Yale or Harvard or a European university. So that presented a problem for Brainerd now that he was being expelled from Yale. And so on September the 15th, 1743, 281 years ago today, he wrote a letter to the president and to the trustees confessing his sin and agreeing to confess it to the student body. But his appeal was rejected. And yet God, in his wisdom and mercy, work that situation out for his glory and for the good of humanity. A group of ministers licensed David themselves to preach and appointed him as a missionary to the American Indians. And in the remaining years of his life, he only lived to be 29 because he died of tuberculosis. But in his remaining years, God used him as the human agent to bring the great awakening that we have heard about from the 1740s to the American Indians in Massachusetts and New Jersey and Pennsylvania. But that's not all. A man named Jonathan Dickinson and Aaron Burr Sr., who were both Yale grads, were bothered by the fact that Yale would not receive his apology. And so through those circumstances, they decided to plant a school in Dickinson's home. The name of that school, the College of New Jersey, that would be later known as Princeton University. Incidentally, Brainerd would be the first student of that university as he lived his remaining days before he died in Dickinson's home. Here's the point. God used Brainerd's sin in a sinless way. That's something we see over and over again in the Scripture. God does not sanction sin. When God's people sin, uh, he gets out the switch, and we, get in, we become under his discipline. But he, he always uses sin in a sinless way. We see that ultimately in the cross. But we also see it in our passage 
tonight. So we saw, just read that Jacob, he desires to see his brother. That's a noble thing. He desires to be reconciled to his brother. That's a noble thing. Uh, there's growth and maturity with, with Jacob. And yet he's still conniving. He's still manipulating. He's still not fully trusting God and his promises. So he seeks to buy Esau's favor. He seeks to appease him, to use the biblical text, with his herds. Well, today we see that he's still acting in self-interest because he's going to send his wives and his children ahead of him to Esau and all the unknowns that lie there. And he remains back and out of self-protection, really. But God uses sin in a sinless way. It will be in this isolation due to his own sin out of self-protection that a man is going to encounter him. But he's not just a man. He's a man, but he's more than a man. And that brings us to the first part of this passage in verse 22, wrestling with God, wrestling with God. Verse 22, the same night he arose, took his two wives, his two female servants and his 11 children across the ford of the Jebak. He took them and sent them across the stream, everything else that he had. So he sends everyone ahead of him across the stream. It appears here that this is a cowardly act. He is acting out of self-preservation. But for now, although this encounter with Esau was due to Jacob's noble desire to reconcile, we know even from the prayer that we saw last week that Jacob is eat up with fear. And God's going to answer his prayer, but not the way he thinks. Verse 24. And Jacob was left alone. Oftentimes, it's when we are left alone that God comes to us in unique ways. We're too busy. Things are too loud in our culture. Um, We saw the last time Jacob was alone was when uh, God comes to him but via the ladder that we know ultimately is the Son of God, as Jesus himself says. But it says he was left alone, and a man wrestled with him until the breaking of the day. Now, this is a mysterious text because this is a mysterious figure. Now, in piecing this together, is first of all... Um, important to see that it's a man. You can't get any clearer than that. A man wrestled with him, okay, until the breaking of the day. So it's a man. Of course, we know from earlier text in Genesis, Genesis 18 being an example, that divine beings may appear as men. We might say the divine being may appear as a man. Three men appear uh, to Abraham in Exodus or Genesis 18. Two of them were angels. One of them was clearly the Lord. Making this more complicated, Hosea tells us in chapter 12, verse 4, that it was an angel. So it's a man, and Hosea says it's an angel, and we know the Bible does not contradict itself. I believe this was the angel of the Lord. Now, he's going to show up a few times. So, for instance, in Exodus chapter 3, at the burning bush, the angel of the Lord appeared to Moses in a flame of fire out of the midst of a bush. That's the angel of the Lord. Verse 4, when the Lord saw that he turned aside to see, God called to him out of the bush. So there you have the angel of the Lord, angel just being a messenger, and yet we see that God, the Lord, is the one calling him out of the bush. They don't have a full-blown Trinitarian theology in the Old Testament. We need the light of the New Testament to, to shed light on the Old Testament. The Old Testament is like a dimly lighted but richly furnished chamber, B.B. Warfield tells us. But 
we recognize that the triune God is triune for all eternity. He doesn't become triune when Jesus uh, comes to us by hypostatic union. I believe this angel of the Lord is a Christophany, a pre-incarnate manifestation of the Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. I think the Old Testament preparing us for the incarnation. Another example of that is in Judges 13, verse 17. Manoah, that is angel, uh, this would be Samson's fa- uh, father, said to the angel of the Lord, what is your name? And the angel of the Lord said to him, why do you ask my name? Seeing it is wonderful. A regular angel doesn't speak like that. Uh, this name is too wonderful to utter to Manoah. And Manoah said to his wife, we shall surely die, for we have seen God. And so the angel of the Lord there is clearly more than just a created being known as an angel. I believe this is a Christophany. And I think that's what we see here. In fact, as we're going to see, Jacob is going to ask this man to bless him. God is the one who blesses. Um, In fact, we're going to see this man changes Jacob's name. Only God is the one who changes names in the Old Testament. This man refuses, as we're going to see, to unveil his name, much like with Manoah. And finally, Jacob is going to name this place Penuel because he says he saw God face to face. So this is a man... But he's more than a man. Significantly, this man is said to wrestle with God, and it's not vice versa. He comes to wrestle with Jacob. He takes the initiative. And it's not insignificant that the word wrestle in Hebrew sounds like Jacob. I think that's being communicating something as well. A.W. Pink says this, Jacob was not wrestling with this man to obtain a blessing. Instead, the man was wrestling with Jacob to gain some object from him. It was to reduce Jacob to a sense of his nothingness. By the way, that's a grace. It is, it is a severe mercy, but it's a mercy. To cause him to see what a poor, helpless, and worthless creature he was. By the way, when he's doing that, He's got plans. He doesn't do that just to keep you in the ash heap. He raises us up. God has plans when he does that. Be encouraged by that. It was to teach us through him the all-important lesson that in recognized weakness lies our strength. That's what Jacob is being taught. Jacob at this point does not see the wrestling for what it is or what it was. It was a parable really of his life. His life had been characterized as being too strong and as a struggle. So for instance, Jacob and Esau struggled with each other in the womb. In chapter 27, he had wrestled, so to speak, with Isaac. In chapters 29 to 31, he's just been one big wrestling match with with Laban. But now, He's wrestling with God because fundamentally behind all of those battles, he had a problem with God, not man. And the fact that this wrestling match took place at night, and we know that because they wrestled till the breaking of the day, um, this signals a couple of things. First of all, the, the darkness is concealing this man's identity, all right? Because it will be in the fullness of time that the Son of God takes on human flesh. All right? But second, night in the scripture is often associated with self examination. And I think that's where Jacob is, and that's where God has him. Verse 25 When the man saw that he did not prevail against Jacob. Now, this is attributing human like. Emotions or human like uh, qualities to this divine figure for the benefit of the reader, okay? 
Um, and so this is, we need to see this for what it is. When he saw, when he saw that, that he did not prevail against Jacob, he touched his hip socket and Jacob's hip was put out of joint as he wrestled with him. So there's mystery in this verse, but understand that one thing we cannot take from this is that this mysterious figure lacks power. Because the moment he wants to bring Jacob down, he brings him down. He touches his hip, right? And, and so th this is not the case here. He, he does not lack power. He's not impotent. I think this language is here to show us that this was a real fight. This was a real wrestling match. It was a struggle. All of his life, Jacob had been struggling with people. And, and he had come out victor victorious and yet a loser. And yet through his craftiness, uh, he, though he was a victor, he had lost everything. He had lost much of everything, that is. He, he had won with his brother, but he had lost his relationship with his brother. He had won with his parents or his father. He had lost. He had won with Laban, but he had lost because he was too strong. But now his strength is, broke, is being broken. Verse 26. Then he said, let me go for the day has broken. But Jacob said, I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now God has already promised blessing to Jacob more than once. We saw it in chapter 28, we saw it in chapter 31. But for God, from God's perspective, in order for Jacob to steward the blessings that God has for him, Jacob has to be broken. His sin has to be confronted. Jacob is too strong to steward the blessings that God has promised him. Physical strength, self-sufficiency had characterized his life. But notice what's happening before our very eyes. He's being tethered to God because he's being stripped of his strength. That's a good place to be. If you're not tethered to God tonight, and what I mean by that is that your life is hidden with Christ in God, as we see in Colossians 3, and that's your reality. That's, that's your um, deepest aspiration. If you're not tethered to God tonight, let me just tell you, you're too strong. And it just may be God has to bring you to the end of yourself by stripping you of everything you hold dear that keeps you in the way, keeps it in the way of him. I think that's where... He has Jacob here. There's nothing more empowering than to throw your arms in weakness around the Son of God. And I believe this is the Son of God. And to cling. But that's not going to happen if you're too strong. It just doesn't. And the reason perhaps our devotional lives are not as fervent as they should be the reason perhaps corporate worship for you is not as fervent as it should be, it may be you're too strong. I'm reminded of Uzziah. It says he was marvelously helped, King Uzziah, until he became strong. That's scary and horrifying language. Earlier we see Jacob throughout his life has been scheming, but here he's clinging. What a great place to be. Clingers have learned it's not by might, not by power, but by my spirit, says the Lord. He is coming to realize that there is nothing more important than the blessing of God, which includes, first and foremost, God himself. That's where he is. I will not let you go unless you bless me. Now, obviously, this man could have crippled Jacob 
immediately, I mean in the first minute of the contest, this thing could have been over in the first five seconds of this wrestling match. So why did he let it go on as he did? This man, who I believe to be the son of God, he wanted Jacob to know, Jacob to see Jacob's own self-will in action. He fights with this being all night. This is Jacob's self-will that has shown itself in every relationship he's ever had. And he had to be broken. But in order to be broken, he had to see it for himself. Isn't it true we don't generally cling to the Lord until we're broken? We may play the game. We may go through the motions. It may be a part of the way we were raised. It's a part of our our DNA, but we generally do not cling to the Lord until we're broken. Ask Peter about that, the apostle Peter. In fact, in verse 27, it's made clear that God is exposing Jacob to Jacob so that Jacob can understand what blessings God has for him. That brings us to the second part of this passage. We've seen wrestling with God here. We see a blessing from God. Verse 27. And he said to him, what is your name? And he said, Jacob. Of course, this question is a rhetorical question. God never asks questions so that he can learn information. He is omniscient. He is all-knowing. So he's asking Jacob, what's your name for Jacob's benefit? Jacob responds, Jacob. In other words, I am the hill snatcher. I'm the grasper. I'm the schemer. That's what Jacob means. That was Esau's point, by the way, all the way back in chapter 27, verse 36, when Esau said of Jacob, Is he not rightly named Jacob? So clearly that name meant something, and it was not a positive thing. And now Jacob is answering Esau. Yes, I was rightly named. My name is Jacob. That's true of every person, okay? At some point until God breaks them. And it was only after Jacob acknowledged that that he was ready for the blessing. Of course, we know the blessings are going to come in the future, but he's going to install him with an initial blessing. And we see it, verse 28. Then he said, your name shall no longer be called Jacob, but Israel. For you have striven with God and with men and have prevailed. Now, keep in mind, during a time when the blessings were still future promises, all right, for the patriarchs, largely speaking, the blessings were future promises. The new name was a tangible benefit that the patriarchs received immediately, okay, to assure them of these future blessings, Now, an important aspect of this renaming of Jacob is the person who's renaming him. This is clearly, uh, he's giving Jacob a new status. Only God can do that. But interestingly, for those of you that like Bible trivia, this is the first time you read the name Israel in the Bible. Right there. The new name is Israel. Jacob becomes the third person renamed by God in the Bible. Abram was renamed Abraham. Sarai was renamed Sarah. And so his name is changed from hill snatcher, cheat, deceiver to Israel. Now, what does the name mean? Well, it's a compound word. Two words. Uh, The first is Sarah, meaning fight or struggle, prevail, rule, and El, meaning God, okay? 
So commentators have taken this in light of verse, second part of verse 28 to mean that he struggles, he prevails with God. But in other cases, names compounded from a verb and the name God, God isn't the object of the verb, God is the subject. So let me give you a couple of examples. Daniel, Daniel means God judges, not he judges God. Another example is Samuel. Samuel means God heard, not he heard God. So if you follow that principle here, and it's not a major issue, but I do think the emphasis is here on God prevailing rather than Jacob prevailing. I think Israel means probably better the Lord or God prevails. So how does this fit Verse 28, the language is ironic. Uh, With men, Jacob had contended and prevailed successfully time and time again. And yet each time, as he prevailed, he lost. We've seen that, haven't we? He prevailed, but he lost. He successfully cheated his, uh, his, his brother Esau, but he lost. But in this battle... He prevails for a time with the man, but ultimately he loses. Ironically, this victory by God and Jacob's, really the first loss, was his first victory. Jacob wins by losing. And so from then on, someone might ask, I thought your name was Jacob. And he could have responded, it was But something happened. God prevailed. My name is Israel. Interestingly, this is, we'll see this more in uh, the ensuing narrative. After Abram was renamed Abraham, he's never called Abram again. After Sarai is renamed Sarah, she's never called Sarah again. But After Jacob is renamed to Israel, he will be called Jacob more often still than he is Israel. In other words, he's no longer just Jacob. He's also Israel. He's still got some hill snatcher in him. He's still got some deceit in him. But God has prevailed with him. That's just like us. We're looking in the mirror as we read about Jacob. Verse 29, then Jacob asked him, please tell me your name. I think there's great progress here because up to now, Jacob has been very self-absorbed. Have you noticed self-absorbed people don't ask you questions, but they like to talk about themselves. Jacob is now turned out. Tell me, what is your name? Tell me your name name but he said why is it that you ask my name he doesn't answer him does he just like in judges maybe his name was too wonderful more revelation had to unfold before we could come to terms with that name and there he blessed him and so Jacob called the name of the place Peniel saying, for I have seen God face to face, and yet my life has been delivered. So there's two questions here. The first one is by Jacob. Would you give me your name? Jacob no longer appears to be content with superficial knowledge about God. He wants to know him at this point. He had to be brought to the end of himself, but now he wants to know him. We also see this second question, which is a rhetorical question. Why is it that you want to know my name? Why is it that you ask my name? Again, it reminds me of Judges 13. Why do you ask my name seeing it is wonderful? Hosea, in his prophecy, draws this parallel between Jacob's grasping the God-man here 
And in his grasping Esau's heel. Here's what Hosea says in Hosea 12. In the womb, he took his brother by the heel. And in his manhood, he strove with God. Isn't that great? He strove with God. So even Hosea says he's an angel, but he's God. You know, it's interesting that one of the crucial promises that God has made to Jacob is that he would be with him. He has promised his presence. It's ironic in light of the wrestling match because God has never been more present with Jacob than he is in this painful encounter with him. Don't lose sight of that. But because Jacob was not yet fully broken, I don't believe Jacob was converted here. I believe he's already been converted. Uh, we, I believe that when God came to him through that ladder of the angels, I believe that uh, Padan Hamram, I think that's where he was converted. We saw him pray this amazing prayer last week in, in the early part of chapter 32. But I believe that he is like a lot of believers. He's a believer, but he remains unbroken. Okay? And so, um, because he wasn't yet broken... God's presence was a time of great pain and struggle rather than a time of great joy. But he's present with him. Well, the chapter here is going to conclude with Jacob naming this place Penuel, which is a a takeoff on the name Peniel, because he has seen God face to face, and yet his life has been preserved. Verse 31. The sun rose upon him as he passed Penuel, limping because of his hip. As a side story, I'm going to embarrass Matthew. When we were looking for a missions pastor, I told my guys that were in that part of that process, I want a man who limps. I meant that metaphorically. But it basically means, as we see here, is a man who's been brought to the end of himself by God and now limps with God rather than limps from him. And as we're interviewing, Matthew walks in, he just had surgery on his knee. And he came in walking like this. I said, there's the guy. You can rename Matthew Jacob. I'm just teasing But he's limping because of his hip. Therefore, to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh that is on the hip socket because he touched the socket of Jacob's hip on the sinew of the thigh. So the limp is going to come to symbolize the believer who no longer walks in his personal strength, which is a big part of our problem, isn't it? but he walks in the strength that God provides. Now, Jacob's life, and certainly the ending here, not the ending of his life, but the ending of this passage, challenges the wrong-headed idea, which really a prosperity kind of gospel. Do good things, and God will bless you. What good thing has Jacob done? And God has blessed him because of his mercy. Because of his promises and his grace. Or you are blessed so nothing is going to hurt. <laughs> well, this text dispels that as well. Jacob came away with a lot of pain. And yet the blessing of God. In his limp, we see God's severe mercy. And this severe mercy, and I believe this is true because he's committed to our godliness. He's committed to our transformation. He's committed to our sanctification. And his name's on the line. He is committed to going to the necessary lengths to produce that transformation in us so that we can limp in his blessing. But until that happens, we can't rightly steward or appropriate those blessings that he has for us in Jesus Christ, which are primarily, by the way, spiritual blessings in this present age. Well, this last verse is kind of like an editorial note 
from Moses that explains a dietary restriction which derives from this story. You don't see it in any other place in the Bible, but to this day, the people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh. And likely, children would ask, Dad, why can't we eat that? And they would respond, let me tell you the story of Jacob. But this is not in the Mosaic law. It was just a tradition. By the way, Israel would come up with a lot of traditions uh, that would become a problem for them. But as well, notice as we saw Israel, we see it for the first time in the Bible. We also see this phrase for the first time in the Bible. The people of Israel. Verse 32. To this day... The people of Israel do not eat the sinew of the thigh. This reminds us that this was written to the people of Israel, the original audience. Moses is writing this to them as they have been redeemed out of Egypt, making their way into the land. And they will be tempted to seek to appropriate God's blessings by deceit, and scheming and Moses reminding them those blessings will come only as God prevails only as God prevails I think there's one other final point that is as significant as any because we know from the New Testament that all the promises of God are yes and amen in Jesus Christ this narrative is a clear signpost to something greater than what we see in this passage. You see, centuries later, the descendants of Jacob, who were a lot like Jacob before his conversion, they will lay their hands on the Son of God. They will have, if you will, a wrestling match with the Son of God. And it will appear they will prevail to the point of the cross. But Jesus doesn't stay there, dead, buried in a tomb because the Lord ultimately prevails. Indeed, Israel, the Lord prevails. And he will be raised And in that resurrection, you will see many who were like Jacob and many of the Gentile nations as well come to the end of themselves as God's blessings are mediated through this crucified but resurrected Son of God. And it will be in this Son of God that we will behold the face of God. Indeed, Penuel in the flesh. This is God's word to us tonight. As Adam and the musicians come forward, let's be reminded that this passage is first and foremost to believers because I, there are commentators, solid guys, who believe this was Jacob's conversion. Maybe so. Maybe when I get to heaven, I'm going to be corrected because even though the Bible's inerrant, I'm not an inerrant interpreter, but I tend to think strongly that he was already converted, and this is a picture of most believers. We've been saved, but we still have a lot of Jacob in us, and we see here that ultimately it's not going to come by your manipulating and fixing and and compromise. It's going to come as the Lord prevails in your life, and until... Until you have been broken and brought to the end of yourself, you are not ready to steward all that God has for you in Jesus Christ. And so, as we sing tonight, I want you to pray, Lord, uh, get that Jacob out of me. Uh, You are the one who prevailed, and you have proven that through the greater Israel, the Lord Jesus Christ. But, for those of you who have not yet trusted in Christ, you are pre-converted Jacob. That's not a good place to be, but you don't have to stay there. You can trust in the one who came to prevail over your life and be Lord 
by his cross and his resurrection. All you have to do is repent of your sins and trust in him, the Lord Jesus Christ. Won't you respond to that tonight as we stand and sing? Thanks for worshiping with us today. If you felt the Lord leading you to respond today, whether that was to receive Christ for the first time or to take your next step in baptism, or if you have a prayer request, we want to start that conversation with you. Visit lakeviewbaptist.org slash contact to get in touch with one of our pastors. And as always, you can stay connected with us through our social media and website.